welcome to the Jurassic Park cast, the Jurassic Park podcast where guests chat with me about Michael Crichton's 1990 novel Jurassic Park and also not that too. My name's Ryan Rogers and I'm a big dumb Jurassic Park fan. Welcome to episode 30 Control, recorded here just after the, the fair this weekend. It was a good time on Labor Day, September 5th, 2022. Thanks for joining me today. A continued thank you to Christoph Oaks of Snail, S-N-A-L-E. Check out his incredible album on Spotify or Bandcamp. And today's intro is from the song Sacrifice to the Inhuman Creature, and our outro is Late Bloomer. We have some corrections today. They're pretty good ones. First of all, in episode 26, Big Rex, I said, let the genie out of the bag, when of course I meant let the cat out of the bottle. Sorry about that. As well, when we were discussing that what LAW stood for, we were way off. It stands for Light Anti-Tank Weapons, not Laser-Assisted Weapons. Light Anti-Tank. And finally, a correction about the docks on the island. This gets confusing, and I don't know if it's a correction or not, but bear with me. In episode 23, the tour part 3, I said Nedry specifically told Dodson to have, quote, his guy meet him at the East Dock Friday night. Not the North Dock, where the big supply boats arrive on page 71, we're told. He adds that the East Dock is a small utility dock. And then Crichton specifically doubles down on that, saying, You got that? Got it, affirms Dodson. Nedry arranged for Dodson to have a boat, quote, waiting at the East Dock of the island, on page 71, we're told. Presumably, this boat is captained by an agent working for Dodson. Maybe this guy is snuck out onto the island on a Friday evening to pick up a parcel from the island at Dodson's behest. He isn't otherwise affiliated with Jurassic Park and therefore not necessarily a second inside man. And that seems probable. In that case, he likely couldn't stroll through the park and over to the visitor center to pick up a parcel from Nedry. Or similarly, saunter into the restaurant or cafeteria to join the rest of the island crew for dinner. Maybe. But given what we've been told up to this point, I presume that the A and B, a ship carrying supplies, would have been moored at the North Dock, matching Nedry's description, where the big supply boats arrive. Hammond specifically says these are supplies needed for his lab on page 153, and it must be a big ship with lots of supplies because they've been unloading for a while and still have three containers they haven't got to yet. This portrays a sense of size that is so big the job is incomplete. Plus, it's described as a cargo vessel, which carries a connotation of size as well. So given all we've been told to this point, the Anby is then said to be a cargo vessel which was moored at the dock of the east side of the island on, on page 153. Wait, isn't it supposed to be at the North Dock? Crichton, wait a sec, you specifically, literally said in the chapter airport when you were laying the foundation of this plan out that you were going to use the East Dock, not the North Dock, where the supply ship unload and then asked, have you got that? And Dodson says, got it. But now you've got a cargo vessel moored on the east side of the island. Later in episode 33, breeding sites and hang in there, we're going to get to that chapter soon. The East Dock is said to be accessible east of the visitor center via a maintenance road that heads into the park on page 176. And somehow the kids and Grant can see the Anby from the southeastern side of the island, suggesting that the North Dock is also on the eastern side of the island. I think we need to read these docks as both being on the east side of the island, but the North Dock is obviously further north than the second dock. The second dock being called East Dock. These docks, therefore, must be nearer to each other than I'd previously believed and suggested. My apologies. This is probably the last we'll discuss of docks, so let's consider this settled. Well, until we get onto the Mesozoic Jungle River, but we won't be there for maybe a hundred pages or so. On to dinosaur news. This goes back to November 2018, but it is highlighted in Pierre J's International Dinosaur Day collection of good articles, so it's got to be good, right? Well, apparently, despite being collected way back in 1992 and being the most complete and anti-ornithine ever discovered in North America, the fossils of what was referred to as the Kyparowitz avisaurid languished undescribed, presumably in California, for almost 15 years before some dutiful paleontologists dusted her off and formally gave her a complete anatomical description. It was named Mirarchi, or Mirachi, Mirarchi maybe, Etani. Miris being Latin for beautiful and Archi being Greek for winged messenger. And Etani honors Jeffrey Eaton for his decades of work contributing to our understanding of the Kaiparowitz formation and the fossils recovered from it. Its holotype, UCMP 139500, is housed at the University of California Museum of Paleontology, and it was, as mentioned before, uncovered from the Kaiparowitz formation in Utah. It's comprised of a partial postcranial skeleton, including three cervical and two thoracic vertebrae, a pygostyle, a forcula, 
the xiphoid process of the sternum, a fragmentary left scapula and a coracoid, the humerus, ulna, radius, manus, and several fused fragments of the pelvic girdle, and some hind limb. Phylogenetically, just by being identified as an enantini ornithine, much can be said about this beautiful winged creature. She would have resembled a modern bird, but was completely different in three pretty major ways. She had teeth and clawed fingers on each wing, and the articulation between its scapula and the coracoid, or part of its shoulder as you would probably otherwise recognize it, is entirely the opposite of what is found in modern birds. But she'd have a bird's thorax, which aids in flight capabilities, a pagostyle, which is a short stubby tail, which sort of helps create a long tail-like feather behind the bird, which substitutes for the long tail you see on lizards, and it had true wings and feathers. The paper says this is one of the most exceptional late Cretaceous enantiornithine fossils and adds a significant volume of data about enantiornithines in North America because, prior to this beauty, the entire clade in North America was only represented by some isolated tarsometatarsi, which I think are just like ankle or toe bones or something like that. It's large enough that Miratki supports the theory that enantiornithines were evolving larger in size in the late Cretaceous and also reveals the presence of remige papillae, or quill knobs, indicating a feature was evolving in parallel with other dromaeosaurids and other derived ornithuromorphs at this time. The quill nubs and Merarchi are similar to the secretary bird or the Ceres crane or the Egyptian vulture, and are also flatter and wider than observed in these modern birds. But most importantly, it sounds like the enantiornithines found in North America are identified or known from only their stinking ankles, generally speaking, so having a fairly robust skeleton that's more than a few tarsometatarsals is nice for a change. In other news, the journal Bio One published in May 2022 very recently a new paper called Intraspecific Facial Bite Marks in Tyrannosaurids Provide Insight into Sexual Maturity and Evolution of Bird-like Intersexual Display which looks like it came out of the Royal Tyrell Museum, which is neat. The frequency with which wounds and scars are found on tyrannosaur skulls are argued to suggest that tyrannosaurs exerted intraspecific aggression, called agonism, as part of their intrasexual selective behaviors, and it's believed that understanding this is important to understanding animal behavioral ecology in reproductive systems. Agonism can be studied by observing extant species like crocodilians, who display extensive intrasexual aggression and deliver wounds and scars to each other, but birds opt for extreme visual or vocal intersexual display. The paper observes, quote, the evolutionary origin of this behavioral divergence and pattern in non-avian dinosaurs is unknown. This paper aims to document the morphology, frequency, and ontogeny of intraspecific facial bite lesions, 324 of them, in a large sample of tyrannosaurids, 202 specimens, 528 elements, to infer patterns of intraspecific aggression in non-avian theropods. All these facial scars have consistent position and orientation across tyrannosaurid species, suggesting bites were inflicted due to repeated postured behavior, argues the paper, but facial scars are absent in young tyrannosaurids then begin to appear in immature animals, which are described at around 50% of the adult skull length, and are present in about 60% of the adult-sized specimens, and the lesions show aggressor victim size isometry. They believe, quote, the ontogenetic distribution of bite scar suggests agonistic behavior is associated with the onset of sexual maturity, and scar presence in approximately half the specimens may relate to a sexual pattern. They conclude with a neat inference, that archosaurs like crocodiles still behave like this, snapping and biting at each other's faces. Quote, intraspecific bite marks are consistent and widely distributed in fossil and extant crocodiliforms and non manoraptoriform theropods, says the paper. But the inverse, the manoraptoriform theropods, think of dromaeosaurs like the velociraptors, don't show all these agonistic facial wounds, suggesting that their divergence evolutionarily may signal a behavioral change as well towards something more bird-like rather than crocodilian. The manoraptorans, or the manoraptora forms, were potentially no longer snapping at each other's faces with dagger-like teeth and instead were res resorting to the more bird-like behavior ex of extreme visual and or vocal intersexual display. The absence of these lesions in manoraptoran theropods, including modern burns, quote, may reflect a transition from bony cranial ornamentation and crocodilian-like intrasexual aggression to avian-like intersexual display with the evolution of pinaceous feathers. And that's pretty interesting, and maybe is another argument against a feathered tyrannosaurus, but that would be news for another time. With the corrections and the dinosaur news out of the way, please 
Let me now introduce you to my special guest this episode. My special guests today are Drs. Matthew Bortz and Adam Pritchard. Matt is the curator for the Duke Lemur Center Museum of Natural History in North Carolina, and Adam is the assistant curator of paleontology at the Virginia Museum of Natural History in Virginia. How are you guys doing today? I'm doing great. <laughs> All right. <laughs> getting there. Getting get, there. Getting there. It's a I tough say, day. I am Matt. <laughs> <laughs> when, there's, when there's two of us, two new voices. Oh, yes. This and voice is Matt. Matt. All right. <laughs> So uh, Matt, Adam, and I, uh, we all met shortly after Elwood and Jake were released on parole from the Joliet Correctional Center. First, Jake and Elwood recruited Matt and his five-piece band, Matt and the Magic Tones, from a deserted Holiday Inn, and then they recruited Adam from the Soul Food Diner against the wishes of Aretha Franklin. And then they met me shortly thereafter outside of Ray's Music Exchange, where we all performed in an ad hoc flash mob performance of Shake a Tail Feather. So it's uh, nice that we kept in touch all that time. It really is. I will never be that cool in my life again. (laughs) Yeah, and I think we can all agree that we, at that point in our lives, we were on a mission from God. <laughs> Do you guys ever and get, always had our sunglasses? Do you ever get up to Chicago anymore? I shifted the scene a little further south. Okay, <laughs> great on. I was uh, I was laughing because we all remember the penguin, of course, and then uh, <laughs> but the actual name was Sister Mary. Do you remember? Her name was Sister Mary Stigmata. Nope. Uh-huh. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Adam and Matt, uh, I, I first came across uh, with some of these things that these guys do uh, when they created a podcast called the Pastime Podcast. Uh, which I th- was it a victim of of the pandemic, or was it because you guys found new careers doing different things and had to discontinue? I think it was it was mostly a victim of us advancing in our careers, yeah, and then having responsibilities to create content for other institutions. Yeah, <laughs> is that a fair characterization, Adam? Yeah. It was- I, I agree. I think it definitely fell off for me once I became a curator, and that's it. that is a role that entails mm-hmm. a lot of different hats and responsibilities, including promotion. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I like to believe it's not entirely dead. Um, it survives out there for people to consume. We didn't make a whole lot of like time dependent content. Like mm-hmm. it's there for people to go learn about all kinds of weird animals from the past, and then we can wake it up. When we find the capacity to do <laughs> it was super the production value was yeah, the, excellent it was a really really great one i, I thought it was a tremendous amount of fun thank you <laughs> I, was, I was gonna say it was it was a lot of fun to make that i miss it as far as being able to make and and also having conversations with adam that often center on jurassic park <laughs> <laughs> well do you guys get to meet up much anymore now that you're now you're in different different places do you see each other very often not as much as we should, because no. we are actually surprising, despite the fact that paleontology often drags people, you know, if you want to follow the career, you are, you know, destined in some ways to travel across the country and end up in lots of different places. But Matt and I ended up about two, two and a half hours apart from each other, <laughs> so no, we need to hang out more. We really do. It, it's like far enough away that we don't like pop over for an afternoon, yeah. but it's close enough that right. it's not like we make plans to see each other, which is what we need to do. <laughs> mm, mm. So what are some of the things you miss most about making the, the podcast? What are some of the highlights or things looking back on it that uh, you're like, wow, really happy with that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I think, I mean, my favorite thing is sitting down with either an interview or a research topic or both. And the brainstorming process with Adam of kind of cutting into the, the core story and really thinking about our, our concept was that we wanted to create content that was approachable to someone. At the time, Dinosaur Train was a very popular kids show, and I know it's out there for kids to continue to discover. But there's this kind of gap in fossil content for students where you kind of go from, like, there's tons of dinosaur picture books, and then there's this, like, adult things, and, like, kids, Mm -hmm. there's something missing for, like, a 12-year-old essentially, who like has learned the names and now wants to know what you do next, but isn't quite at the point of learning anatomical terminology. Mm -hmm. And so our concept was to create a podcast that could be listened to by anybody, but ideally it was this person who had really been fascinated by dinosaurs as a young person. Um, And then they're getting a little older. They want to kind of know what's next. Um, So it meant we were kind of trying to balance like how much new jargon do we introduce? How much do we throw back to previous things? And Working on that with Adam was always a really exciting, fun conversation, and I miss that. Mm-hmm. It was full of energy, I, I that's miss, for sure. Yeah, I miss that too. I, I miss a lot. Oh, I mean, I, I pair a lot of the things you say. Um, the exploration right now, you know, we're kind of we're both kind of restricted to 
the projects that we are expected to work on as part of our, our professional development in our positions. But when you work on something like pastime, I could, if I was like, hey, you know what? I really do want to research shoulder anatomy and homo erectus. <laughs> um, I study ancient reptiles, so that doesn't come up very often. No. Um, and we could do it. We, 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 were, you know, we needed to do it in order to properly tell, tell a story. And if I was to say, one, one thing I think is worth saying about pastime is I think it was instrumental in us continuing in paleontology because we're both, we're both researchers. We both do that kind of work. But in terms of being able to take a topic and crystallize it for virtually any audience, like to think about what a particular audience knows in advance and what they would be most engaged by in putting together a presentation or a video or something like that. Like pastime is the reason I can do that. Like there, there was, it, it was not something that was trained that we were trained to do as part of our graduate experience. Um, but in doing pastime, we had to think about so many different topics and so many different audiences, like, or, well, the, so many parts of our particular audience mm -hmm. that, you know, I don't want to toot my own horn too much, but I, I feel like it's second nature at this point. And I, yeah. And also of course, the kind of concision. I'm, excited. I'm still excited by that. Yeah. And I, I think one of our other reasons in thinking about our audience is we, we wanted to keep things like less than a half hour, closer to 20 minutes if we could, mm -hmm. because that was kind of like to and from the drive to school <laughs> or to soccer practice. Right. And that having some kind of continuity over like the same possible group of kids all sitting together, like listening to this thing is you can't string that over like an hour and a half conversation. Right. And so how do you give people enough context to understand why arm anatomy in Homo erectus is interesting um, or like what it is about that connects whales and hippos. Um, and so provide enough context to then get to the expert interview and let them speak as naturally as possible in the interview section and be able to wrap that up in a way that isn't just a blur of jargon and us talking as quickly mm -hmm. as we could. Well, in terms of doing like community outreach or, or science communication, it was um, a success. It was entirely accessible. It was really well done. I, I loved it. When um, pandemic struck and I came across owning an iPhone or something I get podcasts on, it was one of the, the first things to look for were like dinosaur podcasts just to check them out. And it was um, obviously among them and it, uh, it went right to the top of the list because it was so well put together and it was quick, easy bites and stuff like that. It was a lot of fun. It was cool. Yeah. And I know you, you've talked to um, Dave Marshall from PaleoCast yeah. um, as part of this. And it was kind of amazing when we started podcasts, there were like two other like paleo specific podcasts at the time, like it's going on like 10 years mm -hmm. <laughs> since we started mm -hmm. that. But it was like PaleoCast, um, us, and then like Paleo After Dark were kind of like the only... <laughs> Well, it's funny. As, um, yeah, as this technology becomes more accessible and people are more on the internet, that it seems that, yeah, the passion projects for people to produce more content of all kinds, but certainly of dinosaur content as well, has been... It's very cool. There's so much available. more out there yeah. um, for so many different audiences. Like, it's really exciting how yeah. much has happened. Well, that's cool. So beyond my irresistibly worded media inquiry, which was basically resorting to extortion and blackmail, what made you want to, to join me on a show to talk about a novel that came out 30 years ago? The... I, I like it. <laughs> I mean, well, in all seriousness, I mean, I must admit, as much as the novel was foundational, the film, I, I've come to prefer the film mm -hmm. more, but, I, I, you know, obviously the ideas are crystallized in Craig's book and that, you know, it, it helped propel a, a already forming childhood interests further. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, I think, and it's the case for a lot of people in paleo um, and, and continues to be as, 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 as like a foundational thing. Like they, they see the, they read the book, they see the movie and it's sequels, whatever you might think of their quality, but the, 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 the central focus, you know, on the animals, on these, the, yeah, the animals is is central to a lot of a lot of people getting into the field and you know furthering furthering that interest so that 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 always makes me want to talk about it mm -hmm. and and just to geek out about it in general yeah. it's one of my you know despite its questionable the questionable additions since the inception since its inception yes. um ranging through every possible 
pop culture medium from games to comics to whatever it's it's just it compels me all right yeah. right on. how about you matt and and i think that central role it's interesting i was thinking about in in rereading it in preparation for coming on here because <laughs> um, it had been a long time was thinking about it as kind of the culmination or like almost the coming out party of the dinosaur renaissance mm -hmm. that there is this idea that had been building in professional circles of the vitality of dinosaurs. I think what goes along with the vitality of dinosaurs is the vitality of extinct life. Like mm -hmm. it's goes all the way back to trilobites. And even further than that, that there's this idea that everything is went extinct because it couldn't quite cut it. <laughs> and that part of what goes with that is kind of a, this inevitable decline. Mm -hmm. And we haven't fully shaken the idea of this like progress that evolution represents like this going on and on to something greater and that everything about the past must have something kind of broken about it. Mm -hmm. And that the dinosaur renaissance was specific to like Ostrom and then Bacher kind of like getting out the megaphone and blasting it, but then Jurassic Park and Jack Horner really turning up the volume yeah. on these were animals that could have kept going if it wasn't for a couple of slight differences and just how the geological deck got shuffled. Um, and that Jurassic Park kind of put that in people's heads that like that the not only that, could dinosaurs be vital, but like, let's take a look at, at trilobites. Let's take a look at um, these, you know, kind of things that crawled, crawled out of the water that always kind of look kind of fishy and sluggish and slow. Like there's, a, those are animals and mm -hmm. animals are not typically going to be kind of just gooey, slow moving creatures that are just going to die eventually anyway. And so I think about how Jurassic Park kind of like was this important moment for us to consider that the past was a vital time mm -hmm. and it has an impact on our world today in a way that it people specialists knew that but kind of creating a way that people kind of came around the campfire to, to tell the same story and spend a billion dollars seeing it over and over again <laughs> That's right. um to then understand like the past is is really exciting <laughs> mm -hmm. and just as, as a poll adam maybe and, and matt you just said you finished rereading it is this a book that you, that you guys read multiple times like with any frequency like you said it'd been a while but is it a book you've read you know five times or something like that before i've probably read it that many times but i must admit i did not reread it in preparation no it's okay it's been <laughs> yeah. a while the last time i will say last just to you know the last time i read it was actually on an international adventure with matt uh <laughs> i think i finished it when we were in moscow of all places and yeah, I was inspired to reread it because you were like discussing how different it was, and I never did <laughs> <laughs> because we ended up like, like I I forget what I was working on. I mean, we were working on the podcast at the time, and mm -hmm. I feel like I was taking um, bandwidth. But then, um, yeah, in preparation for this, realized and dissertations. <laughs> yes, exactly, and I feel like that. I don't know. It, it's it had been like in the back of my mind, like gosh, I really need to dive back into it. Partially because actually one of our podcast interviews was with Dr. Uh, Elizabeth Jones, who is uh, a science historian who uh, is now at North Carolina State. She's a postdoc there. Um, and she just released a book um, about basically ancient DNA as a science and kind of the history of that, not just the Jurassic Parkification of it, but the whole idea of getting ancient genetic material from dead things where did that idea come from mm -hmm. and like how does it grow and so in talking to her we we interviewed her for the podcast and and again was reminded like i really like what is in that book actually about genetics like how much of it is like a magic wand gets waved over some, right. some amber and the dinosaurs happen and how much of it feels plausible um and i was surprised in my reread like how much uh it it is prescient like thinking about you know the I was I was born in 1985, so like when I, like as I was a toddler, that people were already thinking about not just cloning, but the idea of needing to splice in genes in order to fill in gaps. Which now there wasn't the technology then to do that. That mm -hmm. CRISPR is this technology that's been discovered to make gene editing much more efficient than anyone could have dreamed in the 90s. Um, which I think is a little bit of the failing then of the sequels. This is like my hobby horse that I have okay. about especially the Jurassic World kind of reboot of Jurassic Park is to look at the technology that's like one of the things that I think is so perfect about Jurassic Park as a concept is it's just Frankenstein. Like it's, <laughs> it's like 
scientists kind of messing with powers we don't really understand yet. Mm -hmm. um, but it, like Mary Shelley had gone to lectures about people like putting electricity through frogs and frogs kind of jolting. So it felt very much like next year, someone might animate a corpse. Like, mm -hmm. what are we going to do when that happens? Um, whereas Jurassic Park, when people saw like dinosaurs being cloned, it's like, well, obviously, like that's a long way off. <laughs> but uh, we are much closer to some of the possible consequences and kind okay. of moral questions around what we do with the genetic information that has been unlocked. I don't even think Crichton necessarily believed that we were as close to like really wrestling with these questions as we are. And that Jurassic World and its sequels are basically just like, you know, the Jurassic Park stuff, like they, they have dinosaurs, like that there isn't Wu kind of going back and and even in Dominion, like the whole idea of like genetically modified crops and mm. giant locusts as a plot device is so feels so 90s. It's very like <laughs> old fashioned in its way of thinking about genetics in a way yeah. it's like, guys, we are way beyond <laughs> what is what is possible um, with kind of real time editing and cloning that we need to, to wrap our heads around. Mm -hmm. And some of it's good, like some of it is there's all kinds of gene therapies being developed for cancer, but you know, what are the, what are the things we should be thinking about for elimination of disease in the world that goes along with the control that we have over genetic information that it would be fun to have a multi million billion dollar blockbuster that also wrestles with that. And yeah. we had it in 1993, but it would have been nice to have it in 2022 as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. There's quite a bit of philosophy in, uh, in the book and in, in the film a little bit, I think, um, Malcolm embodied that as best as possible. I guess Grant a little bit too in that boardroom scene where they say, I don't know. I don't know about this. <laughs> um, I know Adam has Malcolm thoughts. Well, for sure. Well, Adam, <laughs> you mentioned, uh, and you, you'll have to defend yourself a little bit, I think. Um, when you say that the, the novel Certainly. wasn't quite as good as the, the movie, that's kind of the contrary to what um, most people of any person who sees a movie and a book, they always say, oh, the book is so much better. I can't deny that, you know, it was it was obviously Spielberg's adaptation that, that changed the, the the whole cultural embrace of, of dinosaurs for sure what was it about that movie that really stands out that puts it above the, the novel to you it is very feelings driven mm -hmm. um i certainly don't look at the book and say oh structurally this is you know inferior to the movie or anything like that i mm -hmm. mean the action the, there are so many like action scenes and suspense scenes in the book like the river the river raft which I, i'm still shocked that nobody yes in any subsequent film in any subsequent media has like said yeah let's do that mm -hmm. um they did do it in the theme park in the actual theme park okay. <laughs> <laughs> i never rode that ride i should have um but like the the action the suspense obviously like i think the book the book just has more of that and that is superior in terms of feelings i and i think this is a perfect a completely spielbergian thing um I felt like the I feel like the characters in the book are more simplistic, like almost sort of you know they they have their roles they fulfill their roles. Malcolm Malcolm I struggled with in particular because there were so many scenes where he is a mouth he is a mouthpiece for what I think is a very negative view of science as a concept. Mm -hmm. I especially remember a scene I think he's talking to Ellie about the inherently destructive nature of a paleo specifically. Mm -hmm. And that's something I don't, I can't disagree with. Like there, there is, you know, there is that, but I, in the book, as I recall, there's very little pushback on that. It's mm -hmm. like, nope, it's destructive. <laughs> yeah. Let's end it there. Yeah. And that only doesn't I, say I, a lot in the book. No, <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of <laughs> present for people to talk at in a way that like, God bless yes. Laura Dern. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I, that scene sort of crystallized for me some of the attitudes, and they're definitely attitudes that continue into to many of Crichton's other books uh, subsequent to Jurassic Park. Although I've read, I don't know if I ever read Congo. Not that, neither here nor there. Um, and and it's those those attitudes that sort of permeate it. Mm -hmm. In addition to the the sort of the flatness of the characters that 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 make me feel more strongly towards towards the film mm -hmm. um and I, I don't know i don't know how, how how Crichton felt about this i'd love if you know this i would love to 
know how Crichton felt about this because obviously in the book, Malcolm is somewhat his mouthpiece. He presents these ideas that like, you know, science, mm, gotta, gotta be really, you know, gotta be really careful with science, which again, it's, mm-hmm. it's not something I disagree with. I just, the pushback on that was just non-existent. But the book comes out, people are fascinated by it. People get fascinated about dinosaurs. Um, the movie comes out that explodes like that, that is tenfold increase in that fascination. And it produced a franchise and it produced a generation and an extreme uptake in the scientists exploring these very things. So the people that Malcolm would question that Malcolm, that Crichton, I would assume would also bring up these questions to are suddenly like, ballooned in number so there are more people that are exploring that are that are engaging in these destructive this destructive process Mm -hmm. that is 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 our science and i'd love to know if if like if Crichton was like no this is this is okay or whether it was almost like a like a a moment of of like frustration like no no (laughs) Uh, yeah i don't you know, just, well, because like, it's torn. What was his reaction to that? Yeah, it's like he wants more oversight <laughs> for science, or also just yeah, like to get yeah. rid of the holy enterprise. And like, it's it's hard to kind of see, especially because then you have state of fear that becomes this kind of paranoid, like anti-political thriller about like climate change being kind of an invention of scientists and and the government in a way that all feels kind of contrary to the ideas in Jurassic Park where it's like the government should be more involved Mm -hmm. with what's going on or at least we should talk about this more publicly like what we're discovering and what we're going to do with that information and Mm -hmm. people can change over time and yeah I I agree that I mean Malcolm also it's like he breaks his leg or he's like brought in just so that he is literally sitting in place to pontificate yeah in a way that you don't really have to have that character in some ways in Jurassic Park. Mm-hmm. Like the, again, like Frankenstein, there's no character in Frankenstein who's like looming over like Victor's shoulder being like, I don't know, man, <laughs> seems like a bad idea. Like what's going to happen when it gets out? <laughs> like what kind of, does it have soul? It's like, because you're a reader and yeah. you are watching what's going on and you can like, it, you're being shown. And so like the show don't tell instinct mm-hmm. is something that I think Spielberg has a much better, or, well, I think David Kemp also, like took the script that Crichton had and was able to infuse a lot more character. And I think had the intuition for how do we, how do we balance our showing and our telling? Cause there's some telling you have to do when it comes to creating a two and a half minute cartoon that explains what DNA is, which I think is also one of the most important things that Jurassic Park did is like, mm-hmm. I don't think without Jurassic Park, people would know what DNA was for better and worse. Like, yeah. I don't know how much people would, be fearful of genetically modified foods in the same way without Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also don't know how many more people would be interested as young people who develop scientific interests to go into genetics, to come up with interesting therapies, come up with all of the powerful things that we can do for good um, that can come from knowing what DNA is. And so like you do tell that. So people have that information walking out of the theaters, like everyone knew what DNA was in a way that without Jurassic Park, I don't know when we would have all learned that in that Mm -hmm. same way, which I think is a really important thing that came out of this. But you also then don't need someone popping up in the third act being like, just to reiterate my point, (laughs) this all seems like a bad idea and I'm still right about it all going to crap. (laughs) Yes. Well, Adam, I think you're entirely right. Spielberg either worked really, really hard at it or he's just a genius when it comes to like making characters that are, are wonderful. And they, one of the best parts, of, obviously, dinosaurs, best part. And then sound effects, special effects, second best part. But then very, very high up on that list of the great things in that film is the, the characterization that goes on and the performances with the cast, um, making all of them somebody you're really interested in. You you certainly like Lex in the movie far more than you like Lex in the book. And I would say the same for maybe Tim, but almost mm-hmm. all of them. And like uh, the, the, the banter between them is so natural and, and wonderful. And they just have little, I mean, Malcolm is funnier <laughs> in in the movie than he ever could have been in the novel. Yeah. Um, so Spielberg, either through great effort or through just genius, gave us a product that was extraordinary. And I, I can't take that away from anybody's opinion. That's a yeah, the film was wonderful in that way. Now, like the ending, did that make a ton of sense? Not really, but <laughs> the special effects and the and the, the characters are just the what a plus heresy. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and and then in terms of creating adaptation that is accessible for the general public, like 
the chapter where they go through the tour and they they show everyone the the uh, the extraction room and then the cloning sequence and then the hatchery and then the nursery where they're at that's boring and it's long and it's, there's a lot going on but you know spielberg says what if we had mr dna <laughs> and this cartoon pops up mm -hmm. and gives you the whole spiel and it gets it done in 75 seconds it's incredible I don't know, Matt, you were talking about how, how DNA has come a long ways, especially, and that what they had known then at that time is remarkable in a lot of ways. The, in this reread, it impressed you how much was known at that time. Was there more that you wanted to, to, to say about that? Um, I think there's, there's some discussion of the, the idea of like, what, you can, what, what, the, what the technology can do mm -hmm. and also like the processing power that's required to do it that felt prescient like it's still there's still problems people are wrestling with that are about the degradation of dna that are about like how do you hold this much information how do you sequence this much information that really made me want to go back and this is something just in general with the history of science like i'm always kind of in awe of what people could know given the tools that they had at their disposal mm. um that we that watson and crick could get any idea of the structure of dna when they did is like this kind of crazy idea like it feels like a, you know a world of like paper wood and like barely plastic yet is able to resolve that question how you know early physicists were able to kind of not early physicists but i guess early physicists were able to kind of make the measurements that they could to demonstrate um the kinds of like effects that objects had in space that we could detect gravity <laughs> when we did are kind of these amazing things like looking back that people have been yearning to figure these things out. And we kind of take for granted the tools that make it easier for us to do now. Like we can sequence DNA much more quickly than we could in the 90s. But the idea of what you could do with it and like the potential of it was very much something that was on people's minds. Mm -hmm. um, and that to have the, the amount of information you needed to have that foresight um, was is really kind of shocking in its way. Again, that this is a book that came out, like it would have been written in the late 80s and the research was going on before that um, is, really insane to me <laughs> <laughs> for sure and one of the things i think we were talking about, a little bit about horner and uh, i know that he's got this would you call it a dna project where he's trying to reverse engineer the dinosaur out of a chicken um i don't know how that's going along it sounds like he's been doing it for boy it feels like a long time but the idea <laughs> that you can somehow hit the triggers and switches in the dna to stop a bird from not growing a reptile like tail and then allow it to grow some teeth and all the genes that stop it from growing claws and fingers and stuff like that that you can somehow switch those and then this in this egg i guess you'll grow uh, a horrible chicken <laughs> and uh i don't know how that's coming along but like it's amazing i don't that, know either <laughs> it's interesting that well, like this concept of building a dinosaur went from well let's not clone it let's find the dormant the the dormant genes that are already in the ancestors of a, of a dinosaur the chicken and just um, try and dig them out of there, which is a really hy hypothetical situation. I, like, I, I can't wait to see how that plays out, but that could be very interesting. I think one thing that's worth, uh, definitely worth noting about that is despite you know, the, the, the interesting concept and definitely the, the, the ethical concerns about that, there has not been, as far as I know, a scientific paper or even a meeting abstract that actively discusses this project. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like it's progress, and it's, it's the benchmark for what we what we what we do. I mean, yeah, you know, a, a releasing information about an ongoing project is is one thing, but that doesn't translate into you know, for example, the kind of results that someone like Michael Crichton would incorporate into the fiction into into a narrative about what science is actively doing. It's a fascinating concept, but as yet, um, it has not borne fruit, as far as I know. Well, and I, I think like, what I feel like that would have been that would have been big. One, <laughs> one of the things that I was thinking about, by the way, <laughs> with with the advance in DNA that mm -hmm. I think has been a little bit of a roadblock that we didn't understand at the time, which I think is a roadblock for reverse engineering a dinosaur from a chicken, is that we I think at the time, and I guess. I don't necessarily know the history of genetic discovery in quite the way that I should, is there was an assumption like once we have the genome, then we will understand like where the, the gene for like mm -hmm. curly hair is and where the yeah. gene for yeah. like snaggly teeth are. And I think one of the things that has been discovered is like, like at the point the book comes out, like the human genome hasn't been mapped yet. And so 
like that was the goal. And there was a whole lot of attention put on to like trying to do that. But then we discover that it turns out that DNA is just one piece of a much more complicated system that is how life perpetuates itself. And so how proteins fold is like <laughs> one of the big questions now. And like trying all those other building blocks that there's some really, really basic, like we can't point at a gene and say like, this is the one for long tails. And like, let's turn that up. And like, there's some Hox genes that we've isolated that we through embryological experiments know how some genes behave in pretty simplistic ways, but then there's some that are way more complicated and it's sometimes totally unclear what things will be easy to detect as like at the DNA level and what things can't be detected at that level. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that's maybe a piece of why Jurassic Park is also still science fiction. Like we don't have miniature elephants yet, let alone dinosaurs <laughs> is partially cloning itself and like kind of designer cloning. And I wonder if Crichton would have imagined in 2022, we would have kind of designer pets by this point, like at least kind of dogs that have very specific colors or tails or whatever you could like print to order and how much the complexity of the interaction at the, at that kind of DNA level is something we hadn't quite wrapped our heads around yet. Well, I was wondering about, we know that, uh, in the, in the, in the novel, they resort to using amphibian DNA. Sometimes we're told in the novel that avian DNA is very challenging to clone, whereas reptilian DNA was easier. And uh, I don't know about amphibian DNA. They don't make a comment on whether that was easy or not. But I know that uh, if you go back long enough that amphibians were like something out of an H.P. Lovecraft story that would just induce madness if you were to see them. They sounded like the ancestral amphibians were like horrifying monsters. And I, I wonder if you were to take like a salamander and go through its DNA or its egg and deny it clones and genes and stuff like that, what kind of a monster you could grow out of that? Now, that would be very interesting to me as opposed to a fancy chicken. <laughs> But then you don't get a dinosaur, I guess. What's interesting about a salamander is the depth, the comparative depth of time from it to one of these, these giga amphibians of the past. Around 200 and, we'll throw out a number, I think it's pretty accurate, between 290 and 280 million years ago, the ancestors of frogs and salamanders were already animals under 10 under 20 centimeters in length so they 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 were similar in scale to you know your average frog or salamander today 200, 200 250 plus million years ago and it's only going back maybe 30 40 million years further than that that you get animals that are you know a meter long a meter plus in length and I wonder, I actually don't know. So I wonder how much more loss of the sort of the genetic tool, the genetic toolbox has happened in, in that group that includes frogs and salamanders and Sicilians that would allow you to re, reinvent um, the traits of gigantic body size or, you know, massive super the ancient, a lot of these ancient amphibians had skulls that just look like they're, 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 oh God, I can't even compare them to, <laughs> to something today. They're very rough in texture. They're, they're just these, these beefy, beefy animals. Um, but very, very, very long time ago, much longer ago than long tailed quote unquote raptor dinosaurs mm -hmm. started evolving bird like traits, frogs and salamanders started becoming things that would recognizably be frogs and salamanders. So I think it's actually, it's, I've, I've never thought of it this way, but yeah, go, like reinventing those traits could very much be a factor of the depth of time from those traits that you're dealing with. For birds, it's probably easier than it is for frogs and salamanders. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, making a hairy elephant, is that <laughs> probably a heck of a lot easier than you know a bird with teeth oh, for sure or something like that well good point good point yeah that <laughs> that the, the problem of dna not lasting for millions of years <laughs> <laughs> emerges oh, yeah. again and, and there's that <laughs> <laughs> So I think another thing, Adam, you were talking about that you were saying, boy, it would be really interesting to talk about would be 
um, the species diversity in in the park. And uh, I know we get all kinds of different dinosaurs. They're mm -hmm. what we've learned about dinosaurs since when this book was written in the late 1980s is significantly different, which is cool. I think some of them are, are pretty low hanging fruit. We know the Velociraptors look very much different uh, than how they were depicted in the film, and uh, subsequently in all of the other films for 30 years. I don't know why they <laughs> still look the same, but uh, well, in, in in terms of what animals have changed, what we've learned that's new about some of them, uh, what do you think? Uh, what are, what are some of the most interesting? discoveries or changes in how they were portrayed in the film or in the in the novel that come to mind to me something that was always interesting was some of the some of the low some of the low tier critters that were chosen mm -hmm. uh, by Crichton to appear in the books colovasaurus is one of the ones that's in there that is basically like uh if you know generally what he wanted on looks like um like a duck-billed dinosaur with a much, you know, much uh, taller, broader skull, um, thumb spike, spikes on its thumbs, stuff like that. Colobosaurus is um, something similar to that, but one that's known from like the most fragmentary of skeletons. So I always thought it was fascinating that in in choosing his in choosing the Hammond list, the InGen list, that that was something that was on there. That's one thing I always noted. That's um, interesting. I can't remember. Microceratops. Microceratops always. Yeah, where did they come yeah, from? Microceratops right? was something that was fascinating in there. Yeah, it's so I, I'd love to know what what encyclopedia of dinosaurs Crichton was Crichton was using. In, I always in doing. kind of wish that they had found a new dinosaur that like that there had been something that had been bitten yeah. that we didn't have a name for, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, and not that like I don't know had some kind of crazy killer instinct that we could never have predicted or something just like an animal that had Strange, extra yeah. horns and they can't really line up with what had been discovered so far because even in 1990 you, know, you could have found the you know dna of diablo ceratops and that wouldn't have been like a thing that was discovered in the ground yet yeah um and so it it, it always seemed like a little bit of a missed opportunity that the idea of sampling from a whole different kind of geological setting <laughs> would have produced like a set of animals, like we don't know what dinosaurs were living at altitude, but there could have been a mosquito that just got blown by the wind from like <laughs> the proto Rockies down, down slope or whatever. Um, and that would have been kind of a fun thing to play with, but instead, I don't know, it makes sense. You want to have some recognizable animals, but I always feel like that was a missed opportunity a little bit for recognizing that we're not using the fossils. Although there's kind of an implication that there is DNA coming out of fossils, that mm. they're sponsoring these digs in the north because DNA might be preserved there. And it's not just the amber that's driving where they're getting genetic information. That's right. But at least in the movies, it's like it's just the amber. And you tend not to find dinosaur skeletons next to amber deposits because yeah. it's kind of a different preservational setting. So you would think that there'd be some variation in that that would have been kind of fun to play with. Looking at the dinosaurs, almost all of them were found like either at the turn of the 20th century or or I guess right there, like they're really old. The, the Tyrannosaur, Triceratops, Stegosaurus, the Adrosaurus, the Apatosaurus, all of that stuff is like 1800s. The more modern ones would have been, I think Dilophosaurus was in a little bit more modern. Myasaur would have been a bit more modern. Yeah. Almost all of them though were really old, and uh, which is interesting. Why would he pick a bunch of ancient ones except for the Sierodactylus, which is the pterosaur that's in there. It was found, it was a new discovery almost um, in the early 80s. So it might have been new when he was l researching for it or something like that. Other, and it's the only one, for some reason, that isn't from a northern dig. And it sounds like being from a northern dig was important because for some reason, uh, over over 60 to 100 million years, uh, the northern dig sites never were hot enough to, <laughs> to uh, uh, destroy the DNA, uh, according to the novel. But except for Sierra Dactylus, which I think was from South America somewhere. So... I don't know, but that yeah. that was—it's so it's an doing... odd collection of dinosaurs, isn't it? But it it, it does in, in a weird way for something that is so um, so advanced in its presentation of dinosaurs. It, it, the sampler platter that you get is something that is very traditional. It's it's the a lot of the kinds of animals that showed up at the like you know in demos from the nineteen sixty four World's Fair. Um, you know, it's, and, and maybe that's part of it. Maybe it is like, you know, the familiarity of Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops and Apatosaurus and things like that, that would motivate him to, to pick, to pick traditional things when he's present, especially when he's, you know, pick things that readers 
are going to glom onto, are going to attach themselves to, and like, okay, I know that dinosaur. Um, and then kind of blow their minds with, but it actually did this. Look yeah. T Rex running. Look at the uh, look at how warm the Stegosaurus is. You know, this, these these traits that people wouldn't necessarily have associated with these these even these classic dinosaurs. And that is something I sometimes wonder how much we're spoiled by Google image search. That the idea of like an entirely like I can just like type in like like Diabloceratops or Bacchiroceratops and I'll get an image of what that looks like in a way that someone reading a novel that doesn't have illustrations of dinosaurs in it, which I've always felt like is a little bit of a loss, <laughs> um, was something that like you want to people have been someone picking up this book has access to a natural history museum and so you want them to at least be able to picture some of these creatures in a way that mm -hmm. I wonder how much that is also, he's like writing a novel that people need to be able to conjure these things up in their head in a way that he did know the movie was coming, but I think maybe having all of these creatures wasn't going to be part of it. I got it. Adam, you said something which really got me thinking, and it was um, how these, they're all these old animals, they're these ones that are kind of depicted in, in some of the more classical art. And uh, in episode 27, I had a paleo... Uh, artist Douglas Henderson come on and he was describing an exhibition that he was at Ooh. and he and a bunch of other paleo artists were in this exhibition they think it was in Hollywood and they presumed that Crichton actually had walked through this exhibition wrote down all of their names and he had used that sample of animals and depictions to influence how he viewed it and I wonder if he intentionally used these classic old dinosaurs for the purposes of them being familiar with people as being the old portrayal of dinosaurs, that the depictions are out there, mm -hmm. and then turn it on its head. I don't think he changed how they look so much, but certainly how they behave. That was a big part of, of it. And uh, yeah. yeah, the way you were describing it, I was like, man, that, there's a connection there. I bet, I wonder, I wonder if Crichton knew it like intentionally or not. Cool. But, there's, but uh, yeah, I can see like the pieces coming together behind the scenes a little bit. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think... It's interesting that you mentioned Ceratodactylus as 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 an outlier, mm -hmm. um, and I can almost I can almost imagine like it, God, you know, I'm psychoanalyzing uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the late the late man's uh, uh, you know plotting and, and world building, but frankly, as much as like Pteranodon is the classic pterosaur. Mm. It's the classic big pterosaur. It's got you know a twenty plus. It's got a twenty plus foot wingspan. It's got the giant head crest, um, a completely toothless beak. The thing is amazing, but not. I've never thought of Pteranodon other than in Jurassic Park three, where they turned it into kind of a monster yeah. monster freak, as a particularly threatening animal. Ceratodactylus, without any any modification is freaky looking okay like you've got the scale you've got the scale of pteranodon there but you've got this mouth that instead of a you know tapering toothless beak is almost this broad flat structure filled with these sharp snaggle teeth <laughs> um crestless it's just it's it's i don't know when i think of terror like intimidating looking members of terror the pterosaurs that's that's a solid choice mm -hmm. um and obviously they are not exactly presented as like kind and gentle animals in the no. uh, in the aviary section of the novel so what, what, talk... i wonder i wonder if that was that was part of that decision because pteranodon you know i love pteranodon but boy it just you know it does not look like something that's going to swoop down and, and cause you yeah. cause you much harm Pe people know they're not getting buzzed by herons <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting. I, I know that in the Ceratodactylus, the, the scene, the aviary, that moment in the book, isn't a very long one. They kind of drift in. They look to see if there's a phone. There's no phone. They get pooped on and bit and chased and picked up off the ground and everything, and they run away. Um, they, they hardly are there, but it's when you read the book, uh, something that really, really sticks out. And then, of course, when they adapted it into the third film, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people were like, very, very pleased to see, ah, yes, finally this moment is in there. You mentioned earlier, too, the Mesozoic Jungle River scene where they hop in a raft and they're trying to escape the Tyrannosaur and it chases them into the river or into the lagoon, one or the other. Maybe it's both. Uh, can you think of other moments that you would have liked to have seen that might have been in the novel that haven't been adapted yet? One one thing that comes to mind, and I, I, I may be stretching, I, I may stretch the podcast a little bit beyond Jurassic Park, but in the Lost World novel, 
regardless of, 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 of what you think of it, there is a scene where um, several of the, the Dodgson team are actively in a Tyrannosaurus nest while the adults are there and it is suspenseful and it is terrifying and they basically at that point discover that the grant hypothesis of not moving doesn't work all the time <laughs> and like there isn't there isn't there isn't a suspense scene like that involved other than you know the, the closest thing is you know the the t-rex and the cars outside of the um outside of the paddock once it breaks out but there isn't it isn't like a suspense scene um an, another sort of suspense scene like that mm -hmm. with um a big theropod or any 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 of the animals and i think I think that's something I would have loved to have seen. Jurassic, obviously, Jurassic World is like let's, you know, let's make the fastest action scenes we can possibly make with these with these giant animals. Mm -hmm. um, so something like that, I feel like, is 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 missing. I think that would have been really impressive to see for sure. And and it's interesting because there is the theoretically suspenseful nest scene at the end of Jurassic Park when they're in like the Velociraptor mm -hmm. nest. Um, mm -hmm which feels so random and tacked on in a way that it feels a little bit like Crichton got to the end and was like, ooh, I have a good idea for mm -hmm. like a scene that I don't think it goes to the end. Like, what if what if Dave Kep can figure out how to like slot this into somewhere in the middle of Act 2? I'll just put this out there as an idea um, because it just feels kind of like tacked on in this way. Mm -hmm. It's also a way to just get Grant separate from the kids and let him not be worried about protecting the kids, but instead just be adventuresome. Um, and so it's interesting that yeah, the way to kind of up the nest scene is to then just have them working with the T-Rex. That nest scene is um, weird, absolutely. And I remember I was just on Reddit in the last month or so, and people are like, this scene doesn't fit. What is this going on here? And I agree. Like, it's insane that you would climb into this raptor pit, into this nest, and it is so flat out insane it doesn't make sense. And they're going to cattle prod Gennaro unless he doesn't go down the hole. It doesn't yeah. make it. It's so bizarre. But if you get uh, at the very end of the third iteration, uh, the last chapter is called Breeding Sites. And I just went through it pretty heavily uh, for an upcoming episode. And in that chapter is when Nedry is like uh, sabotaging the park and getting himself ready to escape into uh, the park with Muldoon's Jeep. And uh, they're scheming a plan. They say, all right, we, uh, we have spotted raptors on the boat. We need to tell uh, the mainland uh, that there are raptors on the boat. Get them to stop the boat. At the same time, Grant, it's called, it's called breeding sites. They've found the, the, the hatched egg in the stegosaur fields. They say, all right, let's um, do the animal count. They do the animal count, discover that there are um, upticks in a, a couple different species. And they say, all right, there must be, therefore, seven breeding sites, I think is what they say. And his plan in that chapter, before the power goes out and everything goes uh, down the drain, is to go and inspect each of the nests. So that is presented but it's totally forgotten about, rightly so, because surviving the night becomes far more important. But you're right. Um, what, the novel, what the movie did so well was tie everything together, bring the characters together, make their motivations very clear. What the novel failed to do, as successfully as the movie anyhow, was to make you feel those things. And so when that important scene at the end comes up, you've forgotten all about it. It doesn't make a lick of sense. And that's jarring. And that's kind of a, you know... A, a failure on Crichton's part. I mean, it's not a perfect novel. Nobody's ever said, hey, this is literary well, excellence. My other, my other <laughs> cynical take on it yeah. was that there was this idea of, like, observing the migratory behavior that they have. This, yeah. like, idea of, like, how do I get, like, Grant to, like, sit back and watch, like, them. But they're not, like, staring at him. Like, how do we get a remove here? Because then it sets up that, like, the sequel. Because there's this idea of, like... What am I going to do next? Because one of the things that's kind of tough, and I think has really confronted a lot of the sequels, is it is such a well-built machine, like, as a book in some ways. Like, it takes place on an island. It's blown up by the Costa Rican government. Like, that, it, it is just, like, hard to make a sequel out of. And so then seeing, like, oh, I guess if, if this does well, if I needed to write another one of these, like, I need to get some dinosaurs off the island. And, like, what are they doing? Like, if they're just, like, running around in the Costa Rican jungle, then they're just going to get shot by commandos at some point in like a predator remake but instead if there's this kind of like migration north happening because we've mm -hmm. seen that they have this migratory behavior then shenanigans can happen wherever i would like to put them so it's interesting that that's not what jurassic world or what 
Lost World is. Mm-hmm. And it's also not what Jurassic World or Jurassic World Dominion, which I thought was supposed to be the yeah. whole point of that movie, yeah. was going to be finally getting to what, in going back and reading this, it's like, I think the whole point was to have this, let's get off the island next time. Yeah. And that we still haven't gotten off the island is so wild. It's it's crazy how right after the prologue, so you're like three chapters into the first novel, dinosaurs are off the island biting people. They're off the island biting people. In the films, yeah. getting the dinosaurs off the island, they don't do it. I guess in the second one, they take a T-Rex, but then they get it right out of there because that was a bad idea. But other than that, the, they dinosaurs don't get to the mainland and, and they keep it that way for so long. It's uh, it's very interesting. Whereas like the dinosaurs leaking into the world or what co- you know uh, w- what that could mean for for the rest of the world starts in chapter three. It's what just I, amazing. Yeah. What I, and that's something like fundamentally to me. You know, obviously I I concur. Matt and I have discussed this extensively, <laughs> especially about Dominion, but about the follow ups to since the original and something you know in terms of something that is presented by the novel oh god the uh, the, the scene with the compies and the infant is that sticks with me yeah. I, I i don't know if i would want that replicated exactly because that oh man that's brutal yeah um i read this novel in third grade and that is burned into my brain in a way that <laughs> like it's like I got back to that section again this time. I can I remember exactly the couch I was on reading that wow. section. <laughs> it sets the tone, doesn't it? It's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody's safe all of a sudden. I think that having more of that. I mean, they, they, in the Jurassic World films, they have scenes of oh no, drivers almost hits a Stegosaurus. You know, oh mm-hmm. you know, pterosaurs are eating the doves that people throw up at a wedding. Um, you know, those it's almost comedic. Like and there's almost comedic aspects to mm-hmm. like oh dinosaurs in the world and and you know dinosaur rescue groups and things like that you know presenting the dinosaurs almost as victims in this world mm-hmm. but especially and this is this wouldn't particularly be cinematic perhaps but especially with small animals like the compsognathids um, and potentially the raptors you know I don't know if I buy a predator type scenario especially if they introduce something like parthenogenesis where the animals independent of each other yeah breed because if they get into a forested environment or some kind of like you know very difficult to traverse environment and start chunking out eggs Mm -hmm. you might have a burmese python in florida situation yeah well that that happened at the uh I remember in Kingston Falls at the YMCA pool when the gremlins got in there. That's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> but I mean, in all seriousness, like, there is a... Oh, the pythons, like, yeah. I think, like, yeah, no, I think there is a, a very compelling, uh, you know, like, he sets that up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He sets that up, like you said. I, I forgot to think about how early that's set up, but, like, having them on the mainland and really integrating themselves and it's into, it's interesting into that world using the raptors on the boat as kind of a ticking clock yep. behind all of this mm-hmm. um is a really interesting that the movie works without having like like there's a story of star wars like the final like trench run being re-edited like that that wasn't how lucas set it up that you needed to have like a, a countdown to really create suspense as a thing that drives action movies. And that Jurassic Park, it, like the, the countdown is just how many people will be alive by the time like the phones are back on. Yeah. Um, but there's not like <laughs> like a, a, you know, one hour to go in a way that like it, it's kind of a hat on a hat to have both like, will we survive this and will we get the power on and will we get there in time to stop people from unloading this boat Mm -hmm. um it's kind of interesting that is it like that was taken out of the adaptation it's just kind of interesting to think about like what creates tension and that we didn't need that and i'd forgotten about that being part of the driver behind Mm -hmm. like grant really needing to get back in some ways it wasn't just survival (laughs) that was driving him that it's also Mm -hmm. this knowledge that he has about what they saw on the boat well, guys, we're almost out of time here. I, uh, I got to say, I wanted to talk more about the Triassic dinosaurs. I wanted to talk more about Triassic species altogether. 
wanted to talk more about, um, I think the they Crichton used a lot of mammalian analogs to represent what the dinosaurs were like. And I think it would have been more fun to talk about mm-hmm. what would happen if they had reptilian or bird or avian uh, analogs instead of, you know, saying that the raptor is like a cheetah or saying that uh, Triceratops is like a rhino. Maybe to talk about there, there's something alien about about uh, how a bird or a, or a reptile stalks its prey versus um, but everything else. And then so much more suspense. Anyhow, there's so many more things we could have done. Would you want to come back and do it some other day? All right, right. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you guys had fun. I'm yeah, so happy yeah. to have pastime back <laughs> for, for, for an hour with me, just my own private show. Uh, thanks so much. <laughs> I've had a, a tremendous amount of fun. Well, thanks so much. I really, really appreciate it. A big thank you to my special guests, Doctors Matt Borth and Adam Pritchard from uh, from the from the terrific little podcast Pastime. Uh, as I understand, you can look that up, and it should still all be there. And it's a tremendous amount of fun, way more fun than this podcast. So go check that out if you get a chance. This week's text is Control, spanning from pages 149 to 154. In the synopsis, Wu, Hammond, and Arnold begin to feel some anxieties of the consultants actually recommending that the park be closed for safety reasons and become leery of Malcolm and Gennaro in particular. While our consultants tour through the sauropod paddock, enjoying the view of a triceratops, apatosaurs, and hadrosaurs. Muldoon, on the other hand, has anxieties of the consultants' actual safety and perhaps his jeep with a rocket launcher just in case, which isn't much of a vouch of confidence for the park's safety, is it? At the same time, a large storm coming in jeopardizes the safety of the big supply ship, the A&B, and since Hammond spared the expense of installing a storm barrier at the docks, this ship must depart early. Oh, and unbelievably, contrary to everything they've been told so far on this tour, Tim spots a rogue velociraptor running amongst the hadrosaurs, and it's so unbelievable everyone scrambles to find an explanation. Characters. Dr. Henry Wu. Wu joins everyone in the control room on page 149, and he believes they successfully engineered the animals and resort to be safe on page 150, we're told. It's Wu's, quote, deepest perception that the park was fundamentally sound, as well as his paleo DNA. Problems in the DNA... The ones he'd been concerned with were essentially point problems in the code, which can be solved with with a minor adjustment. In fact, he's insulted, quote, offended, that someone might think that he, Dr. Wu, would contribute to an unsafe system where a Tyrannosaur could escape. He'd do no such thing. Wu seems concerned that Gennaro might have the power to shut the park down, though Hammond denies that he can do that on page 150. And Wu believes the raptor sighting must be an Othi, we're told on page 153. Donald Gennaro. Gennaro fears what might happen if the Tyrannosaur ever escaped its enclosure on page 149. And Hammond knows that if Gennaro believes in Malcolm's theories that he can cause Hammond serious problems, he can frighten the investors, get them to withdraw their funds, make a stink with the San Jose government, or make trouble, generally speaking. John Hammond. Hammond is quite upset that his tourists are worried about the animals escaping still, saying specifically, damn those people. Hammond believes that Malcolm is the cause of their negativity. He was against us from the start. He doesn't know why everyone is so worried about the, his resort. We're just making a zoo here. World's full of them, and they all work fine. He worries that Malcolm might influence Gennaro to shutting the park down. It burns Hammond that their first visitors are going through the park like accountants, just looking for problems. They aren't experiencing the wonder of it all. When Ann B requests permission to leave without unloading the three final equipment containers with the supplies for the labs, Hammond is frustrated. But this is his fault. He didn't invest in a better doc. Dr. Ian Malcolm. Malcolm is blamed for causing all this, quote, negativity with the consultants on page 150. Hammond scoffs at Malcolm's beliefs that complex systems can't be controlled and that nature can't be imitated. He's going to prove his theory or die trying, says Hammond. That's what he means of Malcolm. When he hears that Tim spotted a raptor among the hadrosaurs, he and Grant want to go back and investigate on 152. And when Malcolm hears that Tim spotted a raptor in among the hadrosaurs, he and Grant want to go back and investigate on 152. He's immediately interested in knowing how old the raptor appeared, because Malcolm is still gathering data for his the animals are breeding argument. John Arnold. He stubs out another cigarette and gets everyone to settle down by reminding them, hey, we believe in the park, let's see how it plays out, rather than worrying about what conclusions the consultants may reach. He and Wu believe the raptor sighting must be in Othnelia, called the Othi, on page 153. When Hammond says he's upset the visitors aren't enjoying the park the way he intended, Arnold admits that's their problem. We can't make them experience wonder. Which is something someone who's spent a lot of time in amusement parks might say. Arnold gives the gym at the NB permission to depart ahead of the storm, on page 153, and then he chastises Hammond for not investing in a storm barrier to protect the dock. 
Robert Muldoon. Muldoon exits an elevator and enters the basement, nodding to a security guard on duty there. As a precaution, he takes a Randler's shoulder launcher and a case of canisters, as well as two gray rockets, and puts them in a gas-powered jeep, just in case he needs to extract the consultants from the tour. Harding. The vet is said to have taken one of the two gas-powered jeeps into the park this morning. We'll find Harding out in the park soon enough, like in the very next chapter. It's expected that the tour will stop and see what Harding is doing on page 154 at the South Fields. Ed Regis. Ed also feels like there's a storm brewing glancing up at the sky, and he tells Lex that Brontosaurus is the biggest dinosaur on page 151, though that's incorrect, technically. Though it's surely the largest animal at Jurassic Park. He tries to downplay that Tim spotted a raptor amongst the hadrosaurs on 152. When the consultants want to go back and investigate the raptor sighting, Regis reveals that the cars are only programmed to move forward. He argues that the raptor must have been one of the Othnelia, who are always jumping the fences. Richard Kiley, The Voice. The Voice chimes in to offer some details on the Apatosaurus on page 151, and he reminds us that the animals don't breed in the park. The next stop on the tour is the Stegosaurus, and The Voice is indifferent to Tim's commands to stop the car. Tim Murphy, he doesn't bother contradicting Regis when he says that Brontosaurus is the largest dinosaur in 151. And peering back at the Hadrosaurus, he spots a Velociraptor moving quickly on 152 and alerts everyone. He tells Malcolm that it was older than the baby they saw in the lab, but smaller than the ones in the holding pen, half the size of the six-foot adults. And Tim confirms he knows he saw a raptor. Dr. Alan Grant, he wants to go back and investigate the raptor sighting on 152. Lex Murphy, she gets told that the Brontosaurus is the biggest dinosaur and then says that she's hungry as things start to get exciting during the raptor sighting. Jim the dock worker, he has a southern drawl and he doesn't like the look of the storm coming up from the south. He's cautious about the weather and how the A&B might hold up in a storm. He requests permission to leave. Triceratops, the jeeps are painted with a red stripe because for some reason it discourages the Triceratops from charging the car. Apatosaurus, these eat the leaves from the palm trees and stand beside the lagoon on page 151. Their, quote, tiny heads reach 50 feet into the air, extended on long necks. They're said to be commonly called brontosaurus. They weigh more than 30 tons, and a single animal is as big as a whole herd of modern elephants. An elephant weighs about 5 tons. That's a rounded average weight. So this would be a herd of, like, 6 elephants, I guess. Uh, maybe more, maybe less. They prefer to be along the lagoon, but not in a swampy area, as you might have seen portrayed in outdated pictures. They're said to prefer dry land. Hadrosaurs. These are duck-billed and look comparatively small beside the apatosaurs. They stand on their hind legs to get at foliage and move gracefully for such large creatures. There are infant hadrosaurs scampering around the adults, eating leaves they drop. The adults nurture the infants even though they were introduced later. Remember, all the dinosaurs are cloned. None are supposed to be breeding. Velociraptors, described as a pale yellow and br with brownish stripes on its back. This critter moves quickly. It's amongst the hadrosaurs in the sauropod paddock. Stegosaurus. These are said to be mid-Jurassic animals evolving about 170 million years ago on page 152. And the Othnelia. These are said to be often difficult to keep in their paddock because they're always jumping the fence. They passed the Ornithischian paddock and the Hypsilophodon highlands a few miles back on the tour. So this critter, if it were an Othi, was way out of its containment although we're sure that it's a raptor, it's not one of those. We're told that these animals are an exception to the usual minute-to-minute -minute control they maintained over the animals. The computers were constantly losing and picking up the Othies as they went into the trees and then came down again. Localities, we have the control room. Uh, it, is, it is again described as dark on page 149, even though there's a massive window overlooking the park right in front of them. The visitor center, we know that the control room is on the second story, and Muldoon went down to the main floor via an elevator on page 150, where there's a security guard posted. He then goes down another staircase into the basement where he had to flick on the lights. The basement. The basement is filled with two dozen land cruisers arranged in neat rows. There's a gas jeep in the corner of the basement with a red stripe on it. It's one of only two gas-powered vehicles on the island. Behind the jeep is a steel door to the armory, or unmarked armaments room, on page 150. And that's lined with gun racks, including a Randler shoulder launcher and a case of canisters and gray rockets. And note, Randler doesn't appear to be a model or brand of shoulder launcher. It's just what this weapon is called in this novel, as far as I can tell. But I am not against being corrected, so if you know otherwise, you can drop me a line. And Muldoon says that from here, in the basement, he can hear the distant rumble of thunder. And also, we know that the Land Cruisers appear out of the basement to start the tour, so there must be some opening or garage doors that connect directly to the outside. For thunder to be heard in the basement, these garage doors must also be open, right? 
Isla Nublar, the park drive attraction, is said to form an endless loop that tours the park on page 150, returning to the visitor center, but not yet. It will be an endless loop, quote, eventually. So I guess it's incomplete? Or perhaps this means once the park is open, because, like, people are out there and expecting to be returning on this thing, and not eventually, but, like, before dinner. So perhaps that means when the park opens, as opposed to... So when they say eventually, it's... Eventually, when the park opens, it will be an endless loop, as opposed to it's not yet an endless loop, because I think it is an endless loop already. The East Dock is where the A&B departs, and the southern end of the island features volcanic activity, we're reminded. The Sauropod Paddock. The Land Cruisers stop at the Sauropod Paddock, which is called the Sauropod Swamp, and would be the next stop after the Tyrannosaur Paddock. And recall, they share the same lagoon on page 151. A large herd of apatosaurs graze at the edge of the lagoon, eating leaves from the palm trees. There are also several duck-billed hadrosaurs. There are 11 hadrosaurs in the park, including the infants. This might be the entire population here among the patasaurs we, we're looking at. There are 17 apatosaurs in the park. If this is a large herd, does that mean all of them are here or just like some? We know that there are some nearer the helipad when they arrived, right? And there were like four of them there. Um, in any case, there are a lot of apatosaurs on this island, and I guess they're all over the park. Uh, the dock slash A and B. The A and B is a cargo vessel which delivers shipments to Jurassic Park. It makes deliveries every two weeks. We're told on page 153. They have three equipment containers that haven't been offloaded yet. And Jim at the A and B by the East Docks has a southern draw. They're not finished offloading, but the storm pattern south of them doesn't look promising, and they don't want to be caught in the chop if the weather gets worse. Uh, the South Fields. This is where the Stegosaurs live. We're told on page 154. The southern end of the island has more volcanic activity than the north. Illusions and references. Sauropods. A bunch of sauropods are referenced in this chapter, including Brachiosaurus, which is the sauropod featured in the movie Jurassic Park that sneezes on Lex, as well as Brontosaurus, which is a diplodocid similar to Apatosaurus, as well as Ultrasaurus and Seismosaurus. These other two animals are also diplodocids, and Ultrasaurus was renamed Ultrasauros with an O in Saurus because of naming conventions, and then was made a junior synonym of Supersaurus. And like Supersaurus and Ultrasaurus, those are... Really? Stupid names. Like a three-year-old wouldn't come up with such a bad name. What's next? Awesome Saurus? Super Cool Saurus? <laughs> there could be one from Boston called the Wicked Saurus? The world takes all different types of people, so I guess naming these sauropods is fine. It just is my taste. Stylistic techniques. We have some italics. They're so negative. On page 150, says Hammond. And we built this park, this fantastic park with his emphasis again on 153. So Hammond here is using italics a lot to emphasize what people should be focusing on. He's always making an argument against what others are saying to him. And he emphasizes his point so that he's heard and understood, all the while, I guess, disregarding the points others make to him. These emphatic, italicized arguments from Hammond appear to be consistent throughout the novel. It's an interesting graphic representation that he's the one to be heard and not others. Quick, stop the car, a raptor. That said, Tim immediately also wants to be heard, because he spotted a raptor out of its containment. People don't want to listen to him either, believing he must have seen something else instead of considering the implications of what he actually saw. We have Apatosaurus, Brontosaurus, Brachiosaurus, and Ultrasaurus, and Seismosaurus, all italicized. Again, it's a common tradition to italicize proper scientific names and scientific papers, which this novel is not, but perhaps it's more scientific this way? In any case, the proper names of things often receive italics, just like the and B at the dock. And B is also italicized for some reason, uh, as if it were a proper name of a novel or a film. So I guess it's the name of a boat. It's a name. It's a proper name. Ellipses. No stopping it, no. Huge with no natural enemies. Ellipses. My God, think of it. Ellipses on 149. Here, the ellipses imply that conversations are continuing, and we're just getting a sample of them. And that is great. We get bits of the conversation rather than the entirety of these conversations. And ain't nobody got time for that. We've engineered these animals and engineered the resort ellipses on 150, says Wu. Almost like he doesn't know what else to tell the guests. They've proven their work is safe. After this entire explanation on the tour, he's almost speechless here that people still don't believe that the park is safe. Ellipses plus salvage to clear your dock. Ellipses. And you can't use the dock until you do. Ellipses is Arnold, in this case, suggesting that more could be said, but is allowing each example to make the argument that the ship should depart for him. The ellipses is welcoming Hammond to jump in at any time to agree with John. M-dash. M-dash. Jesus, if an animal like that got out. 
we're told on 149. Here the M-dash comes at the beginning of a sentence, indicating that we're spontaneously being interrupted again, portraying that this is a sentence fragment, but not one in which we're to have yet been participating in. So often the uh, M-dash takes us out of a, of a sentence, but in this case it's uh, the sentence interrupting into us. Exclamation! Hey! Stop the car! Quick! Stop the car! Stop the car! Obviously, these exclamations are because Timmy is very excited, and not because he's seen an animal, but because he's intuitively aware of what seeing a velociraptor out of containment means. This isn't the frantic, youthful exuberance of spotting a new animal and being very excited. He's already seen velociraptors, and they've already attacked the fences right in front of him, and he's already sworn out loud about their attacking. He's already been shocked by the sight of a raptor. In this case, he's excited because he knows they shouldn't be out of containment, and that is Siri. Literary Techniques Foreshadowing with the weather. A sudden change in weather often foreshadows a character's luck, mood, or behavior. We hear a distant rumble of thunder, foreshadowing that our protagonist's luck, mood, or behavior are about to change. Now, pathetic fallacy isn't specifically when, when troublesome weather foreshadows troublesome times for our characters. Pathetic fallacy is when weather is personified. So the distant rumble of thunder foreshadowing a storm isn't pathetic fallacy. It's foreshadowing. A rolling growl of thunder as the sky gets darker, lower, and menacing, however, is pathetic fallacy. The sky now is menacing, and the thunder growls. The weather has acquired personification. Motifs. We have responsibility and safety. Wu is on Hammond's side in the the park is safe debate. They see no way the animals can escape and cause harm, even though there have been, quote, too many deaths during construction. We know that Two of them are from a raptor that, in fact, escaped. And I think that security guards are posted as a result of the escaped raptor, too. Why else are there security guards? There's a security guard on duty at the basement steps, recall, on page 150. There's nobody else on the island. What are they securing, and who are they securing things against? The security is in place, I'm sure, not because some terrorist, vandal, or reporter is about to snoop in and cause trouble. Not 100 miles offshore on a remote island where you need a security card to gain access to all the rooms. No, these security guards are in place in case animals escape. They must be. Discussion subjects. Uh, movie adaptations. Dr. Henry Wu has, uh, says something interesting in this chapter, namely that he's, quote, offended that someone might think that he, Dr. Wu, would contribute to an unsafe system where a tyrannosaur could escape. He'd do no such thing. I don't recall him being especially characterized as one with principles, but he's obviously ambitious, incredibly smart, and a talented engineer, but is he also morally strict? I guess to hear that everyone thinks that you've been sloppy in your work as they tour your facilities would be offensive, but in this case, he's personally offended that the tourists would believe he were capable of contributing to a system where such a thing could happen. This suggests that he must take very serious care regarding the ethics of biotechnology. That's a big hang-up on this novel. The, this new industry is unre- uh, unregulated, and anyone could be developing biotech, not necessarily with good intentions, but rather whimsical, money-making ideas instead. Well, it would appear that Wu, rising up in this system on the vanguard of biotechnology, has taken stock of the ethical and moral implications of his work, and must believe that he has made ethical decisions in cloning dinosaurs. I mean, Jurassic Park has a non-pollution policy, and they take especially good care of their dinosaurs, we're told. These may be results of his input. Why not? So if this is Henry Wu, a principled and ethical leader in the biotech industry, he's been incredibly mischaracterized in the Jurassic World films, which, yeah, I know, shock of all shocks, that they were sloppy about their adaptation. Wu became this selfish, ego-driven mad scientist who was creating creatures that were bigger, meaner, with more teeth and sharper claws. He was designing monsters, whereas the real Wu from Crichton's source material wanted to slow the animals down, apply version 4.4, make a safer, more gentle park that all the specially designed cages and weaponry were designed for. He's offended that someone might believe he'd do something so irresponsible as create dangerous animals in unsafe containment facilities. It's interesting, eh? Control is a hoax. Again, returning to the threat of hoaxes being omnipresent, designed to show you what you expect to see here, Jurassic Park staff have been co-opted by the hoax. And not only are being shown what they expect to see, but only look for what they expect to see. Well, what do I mean? When the raptor is spotted, they don't scan the park for an escaped velociraptor, or aim to track velociraptors, or look at their historical movements. Recall on page 126, they could track the Tyrannosaurus' movements over a period of days, which looked like a child's scribble, showing that the two Tyrannosaurus' paths never crossed. That's specifically the type of data they can summon with a few keystrokes that will conclusively reveal where and when raptors are out in the park, but they don't. They expect that it's an Othi. 
they've become accustomed to the authors giving the censors difficulty. And so instead of bothering to track the authors in this way, they say it's nothing to worry about. They opt to not search for what they expect a difficult to track author rather than actually search for what, what was reportedly seen, a loose velociraptor. The park staff have been co-opted by the hoax. They only look for what they expect to see. And in terms of island layout, uh, the island layout, I guess, becomes more complicated in this chapter as we learn more details, or in other words, Crichton has more time to muddle things up, uh, just enough rope to hang himself, so they say. The North Dock and the East Dock descriptions are specifically made distinct by Nedry, and then things get confusing with Arnold and Jim, while the A and B requests permission to depart on page 153. So let's make sense of this. We know that the visitor area is in a secured section of Isla Nublar at the north end of the island, surrounded by fences, barbed wire, and more. And there, the two docks... Both are for people coming and going. The island is a volcanic seamount with sheer cliffs on all sides, and, sp and specifically, there is a 2,000-foot mountain peaking at the northern tip where the helipad is located. As well, Isla Nublar is located 100 miles off the west coast of Costa Rica, so if you were to build some docks, you would put them on the inland side of the island, which is the east side, if you could. That makes sense. There are two docks, the north dock, which is for supply ships and deliveries, and I suppose the second would be for visitors and staff. There's no mention of that, but that seems to be reasonable. It's also reasonable, given those above assumptions, that the two docks are both on the eastern side of the island, where an approaching vessel would have the shortest distance to navigate from the mainland. And because both docks would likely be contained within the fortified and secured visitor area, that's at the northern end of Isla Nublar, and they're likely sort of close to each other. One would be called the East Dock, and the second dock to the north, although still on the eastern side of the island, would be called the North Dock relative to the East Dock. So I'm proposing two docks, both in the visitor area, not too far apart from each other, perhaps a couple of miles only, both on the eastern shore of the island. And in this case, all the boats will be able to use the same navigational lanes to and from the park as well. Not bad, right? I want to sign off today thanking you for joining me. Thank you to my guests today, Drs. Matt Boris and Adam Pritchard. If you want to read along in the book and add some thoughts to what we've been discussing on the show, or be a guest on the show and chat with me about anything you like about Jurassic Park, you can do that by connecting with me. I'm at ryanSrogers at gmail.com. If you'd like to be a guest, drop me a line and we can try and set something up we can rehash, tear down, gush over, and chit-chat about any part of the book, or also not the book, all you'd like. Jurassic Park cast is part of the Spring Chickens banner of an amateur intellectual properties, including the Spring Chickens funny pages, Tomb of the Undead graphic novel, the Second Lapse graphic novelettes, the Infantry, and the worst of them all, the King Street Cave. You can find links to all that package in the show notes or by visiting the schickens.blogspot.com or finding us on Facebook at facebook.com slash springchickencapers or me on Twitter at rogersryan22. Thank you dearly for tuning into the Jurassic Park cast, the Jurassic Park podcast, where we talk about the novel Jurassic Park and also not that too. Until next time.